This is me confessing. This is me admitting. This is me trying to turn around. Trying to turn around the thing that happens every year. Because this. This is where Christmas begins. Dear Christmas, it's not you, it's me. Every year you come around. And every year I hope that I'll have peace and joy and wonder. Every year I place my hope in the gifts you ask me to buy, but I still feel empty. Every year I chase after the seasonal traditions you bring, but I never catch up. Every year I organize my family gatherings that you encourage, but I still need to belong. They're all good things, I know, but they're not the best things. So maybe this is where I go back. Maybe this is where I go back to where it all really begins. It begins with a timeless story that happened in real time. It begins with a baby boy, born to a humble couple, announced by a proclamation from heavenly angels to lowly shepherds. It begins with a word that dwells among us and becomes the lamb that dies for us. You are God with us. You are God for us. And you are God refusing to abandon us. So Christmas, you're here, but I'm here too. Tired, but wide awake. Wide awake. To you. To this. To all of it. Because this. This is where Christmas begins. When the book of Exodus opens up, God's people are in slavery. And very quickly we're reminded of a truth that there are forces at work in this world that seek to enslave and oppress God's people. These are internal forces and some external as well. Internal forces like an addiction, a controlling relationship, sex, power, greed, hurts, hang-ups, or let's go a little deeper, lack of forgiveness, bitterness, cynicism. The Apostle Peter would remind us of something in 2 Peter 2. He would say, people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. And so let me ask you a question. What's mastered you? What's your idol? Some of the forces we face are, are from the outside. Things like cycles of poverty, governments, religions, racism. There are many forces at work that seek to enslave and oppress God's people. A wonderful na lady named Marjorie was reminded of this on a regular basis. Raised in an abusive home, she would end up marrying an abusive man. He would abandon her and three of the children one day, never to be seen again. Marjorie didn't have much education, much training or experience, and she found what she could, a, a job at the local nursing home, but she poured into it and loved on the people. But unfortunately, when she was at work, the kids were at home alone. They didn't live in a good neighborhood, and so it was just a matter of time before one of the kids joined a gang, got involved in drugs, found himself in trouble with the police. Marjorie tried so hard to get ahead in her job, too. But as we said, there, there was always someone that had a little more experience, a little more go get itness. And, and if we're being honest, like brutally honest, Marjorie didn't have the right color skin. She felt like the system was working against her. It was rigged and at times hopeless. 
But, you know, there was a little bright spot in her life, and she loved it. Her, her younger son, he was doing pretty good at school. He's captain of the basketball team, and everyone was saying, it seemed obvious, man, he's going places, he's going to get scholarships, he's going to make it out of here. A proud mom sat at those games. But you can imagine the heartache when she got the phone call one day. Your son's on the way to the hospital. He's been shot. Before she got in the car to head there, she prayed a little prayer. But can we just be brutally honest? She was wondering... God even listening? Even there? Today we're going to talk about a man named Moses, and uh, he was pretty messy as well. But Moses came from a different street than Marjorie. See, Moses was born into wealth and affluence. Uh, He was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. He had privilege. He had power going places. But one day Moses saw one of his fellow Hebrew slaves being beaten by an Egyptian captor and something awoke in him, anger, fury, hate, and he killed that Egyptian slave master. And now with a price on his head we find Moses running for his life out into the wilderness where he would wander for the next 40 years. Do me a favor, everybody, if you could grab your worship guide and pull it out. On the back are some fill-ins, and we're going to go through those today, and we do this sometimes. If you're new to Radiant, let me, let me tell you why. There's a couple good reasons. Number one, because I find that when I write something down, I remember it. But the second reason is even more important. As I'd like you to take that this week, and I'd like you to spend some more time with it in prayer with the Lord. Maybe go back and listen to the sermon again. If you go to radiantonline.org, we post those every Tuesday. You can go to YouTube, subscribe to our channel, and you'll be alerted each week when there's new posts. But take the time this week to dive in a little further and find out what it is God's trying to speak to you through this. Because if you're new to faith, if you're just checking out this God thing and figuring it out, here's a couple things I need you to know right away that's so true. It's true for Moses, it's true for you. And the first one is this, you can't run from God. He sees all things, knows all things, you can't run. And the second one is just as important, you can't hide from your past. How many of you have learned, oh sure, right now it seems okay, and you know what, I've hit it pretty good, but at some point, somewhere along the way, that thing that you covered over, ignored, and pretended wasn't there is going to make itself back into your life. It's going to rear its ugly head. You can't just ignore it. Moses would discover God one day at a burning bush. Many of you maybe know that story. In Exodus 3, 9, though, here's what God had to say to him. He said, the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And what's the first thing you have to know here? So important, get your arms around this. God hears the cries of the oppressed. He's not deaf. He is not distant, far off. He's not ignoring. He hears the cries of the oppressed and he sees your suffering. This God cares. He hears their cries. He sees their suffering. And he's calling Moses to go. We talk about this at Radiant all the time. It's one of our core values. Go, why? What's what's the value behind that? And that's this. We are the sent people of God. This is so important. If you're wondering, what's my role as a Christian? What's my calling? What are we supposed to be doing as Christians? Let me tell you what it is. We are the sent people of God, sent out into the world that wishes to enslave and oppress with a message. It's the same one that Moses will give Pharaoh. Let God's people go. Let them go. We have been sent to set people free from slavery. 
But Moses will ask a question, I bet you've asked at some point, maybe not like he did, but I bet in some way, shape, or form you've asked this question. I know I have. In verse 11, he says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Lord, I think you got the wrong person. Don't you know I've got a past? Don't you know I'm broken? I don't have enough education. I've not been a Christian long enough. Pick your excuse. Did you know Moses had a speech impediment? It's always crazy because when you watch any of the Moses movies, you know, Moses gets up there and he's, you know, this handsome guy, you know, let my people go. You know, he just sounds articulate, he sounds good. You follow the story, Moses didn't do the talking, Aaron did. Moses had a speech impediment. Exodus 4.10, Moses says, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. He had a speech problem. I'm not good enough. I'm too broken. I'm damaged goods. You can't use me. But there's something you have to get your arms around. You have to embrace this. You have to know this. You have to hold on to this. It is so true throughout the pages of the Bible. God can use anyone. Anyone. And he can use you. That's why I love this verse from 2 Corinthians. Man, follow this with me. The Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. And he continues to say to him, that is why for Christ's sake I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. Why? For when I am weak, you are strong. When I am weak, then I am strong. Your story isn't about you and what you can do. It's about what God will do in and through you. It is not by your strength that you set people free. It is only by the power of God that they can be set free. When I am weak, he is strong. Your story is never about you. It's always about him. God gets the glory in your salvation story. And God can use your weakness to demonstrate his glory. All he needs is your willingness to step into his calling. Amen? God used a murderer with a speech impediment to go to Pharaoh with a message, set God's people free. And when Pharaoh heard it, man, he dropped to his knees. He softened his heart. He cried out to God and said, woe is me. Forgive me, Lord. I am so sorry. And he immediately let the Hebrew slaves go. Only it didn't go like that at all for those who know the story. Not even close. It says that God hardened his heart. Man, you don't want to be in a position where God hardens your heart didn't say Pharaoh hardened his heart, by the way. God hardened his heart. He would make life for the Israelites even worse than it was before. And then we open up Ex Exodus 6, 1. And now watch. What does it say? Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Get out of the way. God's coming. Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. And a great reminder that we need to always think further about that it is only by God's power you will be set free. Far too often we try to do it on our own. But only by God's mighty hand and powerful works, can we be set free? What does he say now in verse 5? I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered 
my covenant. One more time, God wants you to know this. I hear your cries. I hear it. And now you're about to see that I'm a promise keeper. My words are true. I have remembered my promises. Verse 6, he says, Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord. And these two words we will see weaved throughout the entire Exodus narrative. I am. In fact, in Exodus chapter 3, when Moses said to God, he said, Who should I say sent me? What did God tell him in Exodus 3.14? He says, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. I am beyond definition. I am above all things. I am eternal, infinite. I it cannot be defined. I am indescribable. I am all-powerful, all-knowing. You can't put me in a box. I'll break out of anything you make. I am who I am. I am God. That is who is sending Many centuries later, Jesus would face a group of people. And they too would be demanding, who do you think you are? What would he say to them in John 8? Before Abraham was born, I am. What was he telling them? You want to know what I'm about to do? You want to know why I'm here? What I'm going to accomplish? You go back to that story in Moses. You read that because the great I am is standing before you. And what did he have to say in Exodus 6? Don't miss this. What did he have to say? I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. He kept going from there. He says, then you will know I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians and I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. Why? I am the Lord. I am the great. I am. Let's put that in some street language real quick so that we can understand what he just said. What did he tell us? He said, I will bring you out of your old life. You can have new life through Jesus Christ. What what else does he tell him? On the next one. I will set you free. You don't have to be enslaved to your past, to your hurts, and to your pains. I can set you free. And the next one he says, I will purchase your freedom, which he did by shedding his blood on the cross. I will adopt you into my family that you can know you are a child of God. And I will bring you into the kingdom where you can be a citizen. You can be an ambassador of the one true king. And I will give you your inheritance because we serve a generous father. Amen? We can do a little better than that. Because anyone who says, by the way, the gospel isn't in the Old Testament, it's right there. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why in John 8, he said, go back to that story. You want to know what I'm about to do? I'm about to do that. Amen? Why? Because I am. No other reason. I am. Later, Moses would pass along another promise from God in Deuteronomy where he would tell him, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you and your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. And God says, I will put my words in his mouth. He will teach them everything I command him. That prophet would be Jesus Christ. And 14 years, 1400 years before he was born, it was prophesied he was coming. God is at work knitting his story together, and his promises are true. 
Long before a baby in a manger, though, shepherds and wise men, God began making a set of promises of which with Moses he was letting them know that Jesus will fulfill ultimately the promises of the great I am. Jesus will set you free. That's good news, right? That's good news. Interesting what we read, though, in verse 9. It said, Moses reported this to the Israelites. Just read the heartache in this. But they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and harsh labor. Sometimes the good news isn't good news to everybody. Preacher would meet Marjorie at the hospital. He would pray with her and give her some encouraging words. But you know what? And and you can just give her an enormous amount of grace. She just, she couldn't hear it. It fell on deaf ears. She was tired. Completely discouraged. Things seemed hopeless. Her son would make it through surgery and live, but his basketball days were over. And that's not the end of the story, thank goodness, because he had been part of an amazing group called Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And a couple of them came around him, mentored him through this time, helped the family. One in particular helped him find scholarships to school that weren't basketball scholarships and find another way. Ten years ago, he graduated from seminary. And now he pastors the church that's just walking distance from the house that he grew up in. He helps with injustice, reconciliation, and healing in the neighborhood and believes with all his heart that the gospel can transform a community. Six rows back each Sunday is a smiling mom who came to understand only through time that God was, in fact, weaving his story into her son's life. It just wasn't the way they thought it was going to be. Sitting next to her is a brother who came to repent one day and give his life to Christ. And now he mentors other young men to step out of gangs and, and, and helps, helps them get off drugs and deal with life's troubles in a way that Jesus Christ would want. Both of them are living sent in their community. They are missionaries right there in the place they grew up. Both of them have the exact same message that Moses had when God sent him. Let my people go. Let my people go. I don't know what you're going through in life. But I, I do want to tell you this. There's something about the holidays that takes whatever emotions you're feeling, whatever hurts, pains, unresolved issues, call it whatever you want, and just seems to exponentially make them worse. I don't know if it's the busyness of the season, the hecticness of it. I, I don't know what it is. And maybe you're walking through one of those difficult times right now. Maybe you're discouraged. And I'm not being pithy when I say, hang on, don't give up. But I do have this to say. It will be in God's timing and his way that he will set you free. And, and the hard part is this. When you say, why? The only why I have for you is this. Because I am. His timing. His way. His will. What he asks of you is to persevere, to remain faithful, and remember that God's words are true. I will set you 
free. With Noah, we were promised that there can be new beginnings. With Abraham, we're reminded that a seed is coming who will bless the world. And with Moses comes the promise, God will set you free. Because promises made, promises kept. Let's pray.